In their three years of existence, Fuzzy Logic wrote and produced over 5,000 seconds of music, played hundreds of hours of gigs, toured over 30 venues across two countries, lost eight Battle of the Bands, and broke over 100 strings, including 90 bass strings and one banjo string. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. The year is 2002, the noughties, as they were never known as back then. President Bush has just unleashed his war on terror. The euro becomes the official currency for 12 states and the Queen Mother dies. 2002 is also the year my enthusiasm for filmmaking began. 80 grand. 100 grand. 250. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And, drunk on lock, stock and two smoking barrels, I try my hand at replicating its slick edit, loaded with Cockney attitude on making a trailer for a local Northampton band. Just like the war on terror, Fuzzy Logic was the product of some creative imagination. That's Jonah, he's the singer in the band. Robin, the guitarist, is a bit nifty with his fingers. Then there's Lee, bangs out a good beat on the drums. Joe's rubbish at playing football, but great on the bass. And that's Doris, the band's oldest groupie. But I never finished it. One minute you're this young, relevant student filmmaker making a documentary that's going to shake up the world about a band that are going to rule it. And the next thing you know, it's nearly 20 years later. Now, I've got this box under my bed where I kept my tapes which had specialist footage on of, I want to say tractors and trains? Yeah, I'll say tractors and trains. And uh, 2019, the internet goes down one day. So I'll dig out these tapes. Thought I'd have a look at one of them. And it turns out it wasn't footage of tractors and trains after all. It was the missing fuzzy logic tapes. I mean, I am still young and relevant. This is a 2010 Nissan Note. Oh, perfect start to the documentary. This is that documentary, 20 years late. I revisit the Fuzzy Logic Studio sessions. The ups and the downs. We found a problem with the singing again. And the eventual downfall. It felt like a loss. It felt like a, a, a bereavement in some respects. I decided to start a band because, although I'd been a bedroom guitarist for quite a few years, um, I hadn't had the, I hadn't plucked up the courage to get out there and play with other people. And after that, I was like, right, okay, I'm, I want to do something now. So I decided to start a band. After putting up an ad, Rob attracted the attention of two locals, drummer Lee and singer Ian, aka Jonah both friends from school. Having a singer whose favourite artist was someone called David Devant and his spirit wife tells you that you're not going to be a normal band. I was a, a big fan of a band called David Devant and his Spirit Wife, who, um, who were very much sort of theatrical performers, and that was a real... Uh, I'd say it was, it was really quite um, influential in the way that I, I tried to front the band 
Uh, I don't think it necessarily made an awful difference to our sound, but um, it was very sort of theatrical, I suppose. Uh, that was always my, my aim. Slash was a big influence on me. Um, I wanted to play like him, I wanted to look like him, I had his poster on the wall. By the time we'd started the band, um, I was having difficulty um, replicating some of his stage presence. Um, I had a hip problem, which meant I couldn't open my legs as wide as he could. Musical style established, the trio was still short of a bass player. We found Joe um, through a mutual friend. I was headhunted. At the time, I was a bassist in a local covers band and one Saturday night I was working in a bar and a girl came up to me and said, are you Joe Crew? I said, yeah, that's me. Uh, she said, are you the bassist? Here we go. Uh, and I said, yeah, that's me. Uh, she said, do you want to be in a band? Because her mate was looking for a bass player. Uh, so I took her number and the rest is history. And then I served her a JD and Coke. He came along to a practice and um, uh, he was okay. We, we weren't sure about, him, sure about him at first because we thought he was really boring. Like there was just nothing to it. No personality. He was just like, yep. Yeah, yeah, nothing. I'd just come out of uh, school. Uh, I was doing my A-levels. So I was used to, you know, being an idiot and spending my time doing stupid things. Uh, and, you know, all of a sudden here I was with uh, some guys who were like all at least two years older than me, which practically when you're 18 or 19, as I was, is middle-aged. Uh, and... <laughs> All they would ever talk about at band practice was things like, you know, top five guitarists or, you know, top three rock ballads. And I just thought, God, this is so boring. Why isn't anyone going to do any jokes? It, it took a while for him to sort of open up. He was a bit younger than the rest of us. And I think he needed to sort of uh, feel safe so that he could start being himself. And boy, did he start being himself. Joe went from being really quiet and boring to being really weird. Uh, for example, I remember going, all of us went up to Newcastle for a weekend and we went to a museum. And while most of us were looking at the exhibits, Joe was looking at things like fixtures and fittings of the room as if they were the things on display. Robin and Joe, I, I'd never really had anything to do with before. Um, and yeah, I remember Joe used to quite often steal my car and drive it around the car park, hanging out the window, cackling like a witch, um, which the rest of the band thought was hilarious. And I, I was absolutely paranoid that he was gonna crash into something. <laughs> With the band familiarising themselves with each other's quirks and their new music, all they needed was a name. I worked at an electrical retailer at the time and um, we sold, uh, obviously, washing machines and there was a washing machine that I just happened to look at one day and it had the words Fuzzy Logic on it. And that's why we were called Fuzzy Logic. Fuzzy Logic quickly got to work, gigging around the Northampton pub scene in 2001. What's your proudest Fuzzy Logic moment apart from today? 
Um, I'd say I was trying to play at the road mender. Um, even though I look fat and puffy. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'd probably say it was the sound house following that, because I didn't look fat and puffy. I'd say that, um, that was probably my proudest moment, because, uh, <laughs> because it was good fun. And you didn't look fat and puffy? I didn't look fat and puffy, and I certainly didn't look puffy. And I thought I had a sore throat, I didn't have a sore throat. It was... Just play for me, please. It was, it was, it was, it was, yeah, and I had plenty of free beer. I remember playing at the cock. <laughs> behind me on one shoulder was Joe, and behind me on the other shoulder was Robin, and they were both concentrating intently on what they were doing. <laughs> Spinning round and seeing Lee just bashing away. I can't even remember what song it was, but turning around and seeing 40, 50 people in the pub, and it felt so good. Cock Hotel was pretty much our second home. If we weren't there quaffing down lagers, we were upstairs in the function room practicing, or we were playing gigs, uh, you know, we were there constantly. I lived by the cock. It was one minute walk from my house. people that we knew from school that were really enthusiastic about our band overall and were quite well they were quite receptive of our music and I think that gave us a lot of confidence. I think we were a bit too dependent on the cock for a while. Having cemented a friendship, risen through the cracks of the cock and propagated their unique flavour of pop metal beyond Kingsthorpe, the band were ready for their next phase. Being in the band and being a musician, you don't often, when you play, get the chance to really hear the way you sound and how your songs are. You're too focused on where you are in the song and what's happening around you. You don't really, I know it sounds weird, but you don't listen to the song. We had a really good feeling about the songs that we had and the sound that we had. And we just felt that if we could get into a good studio uh, and lay down our six best tracks, then we would stand a really good chance of, uh, of, of making it a name for ourselves. I think we always felt that we could achieve more uh, with the right, with the right sound, with the right sound on the CD, and that was what we needed. Our studio recordings were financed by a guy called Ben Lug. To this day, I don't know why. The Dan studio, it, uh, it was down to a guy called Ben Lug who decided that he wanted to finance us to take over the world. So basically it's financing the revolution. And the fuzzy logic out of that revolution. <laughs> Does anybody else want to walk through? Just thought that it was a great idea to give five irresponsible teens and twenty-somethings a load of money and chuck them in a studio. And I, I, can't, I still can't quite get my head around why they did it. Yeah. On 26th March 2002, Ian, Robin, Lee and Joe took the pleasant countryside drive to Premier Studios in Corby. Right, I'm the only person in the world who actually does this. You know, it's 
experience for I think every one of us never having been in a professional music recording studio before. Uh, it was a very exciting time. It was a first time for all of us. It was a big deal. It was really exciting. Um, making our way there, we were just feeling like rock stars. I just remember feeling like I'd made it, which is really strange when you um, have about seven fans, including your parents, and haven't made a bean out of it. I mean, this was the the biggest, most important thing we'd done. We played gigs, we played pub gigs, we played, but the idea was that if we got this recording, we could probably go and play big gigs. This could make me as a singer. Forget the rest of the band if necessary. This was a chance to prove that I was worth it. <laughs> The studio had a drum riser. It was the first time I'd really been on a drum riser. Everything in our live shows up to then was the drum kit gets shoved in a corner. So it was quite nice to be able to be that little bit higher than the rest of the band and be able to see what was really going on. <laughs> they would leave with their debut six track EP. From here onwards, this was it. They were certain they were going to make it big. Thousands of years to come. Neighbors, everybody is good. Fuzzy Logic experience means to me not having to have a day job. So we just got a little bit of a rattle on your floor, Tom. I'm not sure what it was. Just try it for me. Floor, Tom. It's called Lee. Can you hear it? We'd taken some people with us um, on the day. We had Tracy there taking photos. We had uh, Nathan uh, doing camcorder. And we had Nev there as well, getting absolutely smashed. So a meal about free rock and roll, <laughs> free drink. He's waiting for free. And your best oh, moment in Fuzzy Logic history? At the sound house when they had free beer and I drank it all. <laughs> Even though I weren't playing. And there was a big buzz. Um, I think having those extra people there probably fed our egos. I reckon that's why you get the click in there. Hang on, yeah. hang on. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Light saving moment. Yeah. Yeah. Ready, Rob? Just to with it. Yeah. Change the action. Yeah. I mean, probably because you don't know. Three. Three. Right, do you want to, uh, the three of you go down and just make some noise for yes. me? Yeah, I'll record a bit. Yeah. Cool. My favourite Fuzzy Logic song is, is Get Me Through the Night. Definitely Get Me Through the Night. Like it's a classic rock, riff driven, drum filled anthem. Something that you listen to and you feel good. It's a windows down in the car song. <laughs> Da, 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 da. Who wouldn't enjoy such a catchy riff? I remember writing the riff um, and straight away thinking, oh, that's a bit wheezer. But um, as the song developed, um, it became clear that we had something a bit special. Quite often used to take whatever nonsense Rob was playing and um, try and sort of say, that bit, keep that bit, I like that bit. And then 
he'd go off and play that and I'd sit in the corner and try and come up with some lyrics that, that fitted. <laughs> go to the band and say okay I've got this and then as a band we'd um, sort of work out the order and sculpt it together. I wrote the, the words for Get Me Through the Night, uh, I think it was at the Big Noise in Northampton. At the time I was going through quite a few personal issues and it, it, it captured that sort of feeling, that, that need to just get through the next section of whatever you're doing. Walk you home till the dawn And if I ever broke away Where could I go? Leave me not to be myself Just make sure that no one knows Get me Get me out through the night I wrote the song basically talking about how everything in my early 20s was done to excess. I smoked too much, I ate too much, um, when I got the chance I drank too much uh, and it was just get me through to the next thing, get me onto this. I felt like I needed to be the centre of everybody's attention. Get me, get me out through the night Sometimes enough just isn't enough, but somehow too much is just right here. Sometimes enough. I could probably point to a lot of things that were slightly wrong in my life at that time. Um, It's, it, I, it is genuinely difficult to explain. I, I wrote the song. Um, things were, were just crazy in my life. And it, it is just about Get concentrating on what's in front of you. Gets me through the night. Um, it felt a bit more, oh, it felt a bit more gutsy, yeah, um, I'll, I'll have a listen to that as well. You got to, you got to wear a guitar. I think that, that, that we captured something with that that we probably didn't always capture with some of the other stuff. I, I think that some of the other songs that we wrote could have been as good, I don't know whether we worked that one more. It's a well-structured song um, and it kicks ass and I still enjoy listening to 20 years later. Oh, I need to do the solo again. You can re-record the bass solo. That was cool. Really, everyone needs to re-record that bass. The bass. The bass. Ladies and gentlemen, we all the bass line for the solo. The bass line for the solo. It wasn't long, however, before cracks started to become exposed within the band's relationships. One of the things we quickly came to appreciate in the studio is that time is of the essence and is going to go very quickly, and you're under a lot of pressure to get everything done as quickly as you can. You become acutely aware of that ticking clock. So what you don't want in that situation is to suddenly find that there is a, uh, uh, a structural problem with one of your songs.
Unfortunately, that was what happened. Was it the bass that was wrong? That was the guitar. It was guitar, I think. I think it was his last rhythm track. Right. Yeah, so he's yeah, doing it. Yeah. So he's doing it now. Robin uh, he's prone to mistakes, he's prone to uh, slipping out of tune. Uh, his guitar was absolutely useless for keeping tune at the time. <laughs> He got us playing the bit back again and again and we couldn't tell whether it was me out of tune or Joe out of tune or Jonah out of tune. Um, and we kept playing the same bit again and again. And he thinks he's brilliant. Oh, yeah. We should really get rid of him there, shouldn't we? Shut up. Can he hear us? Yeah. It's not really a good sign when the sound engineer that you've only just met that day has to get his guitar out and try and figure out why your song doesn't work. Did it get annoying working with Fuzzy Logic? Yes. <laughs> They weren't in for that long, but uh, the, the thing about recording is that everything's under the microscope. It's in, in the right key. Come no. down a tiny. That's it. The guitar's intonation was all out. So, do you play a lot for Excruciating. That's, that's what we're playing together. After an awful lot of wasted time, bearing in mind that we only had the studio for a day, we discover that actually the reason that we're out of tune isn't due to the musicians. It's due to our singer, whose only job is to be in tune. I eventually figured out it was Jonah who was singing the wrong note. I'll tell you why. Look, I can show you why it doesn't work. You sing that. That's what you sing while I'm doing this. See, so that note contrasts with that one. You can't have those two next to each other, which is what's happening. The guitar's playing that, you're singing that. It doesn't work. So you're going to have to sing that. Once we figured out what the the problem was, uh, we then um, had to endure about 30 takes of getting the word uh, in the right key. Um, and obviously this was uh, really starting to uh, create pressure um, now because the clock is ticking, we're paying for this precious time and we're, um, we're, we're putting multiple uh, takes into one, one line of the song. Get on with it! <laughs> Right, he's ready. Right, I'm going to drop you in after. Tell me. Stand him, he's still. Okay. He's a loser. Okay. 
Does it show you what I mean? Is there something you should tell me? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll sing along in there. Yeah, sure. Right at your jaw, close me. Is there something you should tell me? Cause I just can't live not knowing where I stand. He, yeah, he, he does two different notes. He'll, he drops before to get that second one. Uh, yeah. That was a lot better though, wasn't it? Overall. Yeah, the bit in the end was a little bit I think you went off on a hold to hold. Just going to hear that. Okay. Not we do the first line again, Jonah. This doesn't sound tight enough. Well, I, 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 I mean, obviously I couldn't set the point for it to be changed in the first place, but that does sound... Well, no, it worked for me. I mean, that's, that's all. But. Joe, now can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, it isn't like a treasure Shut up. Joe, Joe, no? Um, that first, do the first line again, yeah? And you've got to make sure you hold that note because there's a, there's a bit where you hold the same note for a couple of words. You've got to make sure you hold it. No, I can't sing. I'll do the harmony for it. When we performed live, uh, quite often we had uh, my best mate Andy uh, playing and singing with us. I actually hate the idea of, of singing along to myself. Uh, I genuinely think that it's, it's vain and self-centred uh, and it, it's quite difficult for me uh, to do. I just don't like the idea. Um, so not having Andy there made things quite difficult for me. It's got a whole repeat factor. Try your original The more you line. hear it, the more it sounds okay. Can you do that? Okay, that's not a problem. Original line. Right at your job, right at your job. Is there something you should tell me? Because I just can't live now and now and where I stand. Sorry, I've done the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> can't hear you, you know. It felt like it took hours to get that right. And it felt like, at that point, we weren't even going to come out of the studio that day with even one completed song. If the singer is singing one note and the guitar's playing a different note and there's a clash, that can work sometimes, but in this case it wasn't working. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> right so it's a you me. It's a something you should tell me. Now I know it where I stand. I think where we've changed it, it doesn't sound as good. Oh, God, this is... We've only, he's only ever got like white once. You know, we tell him to sing, but it is more than that. It's like talking to a bloody wall. Yeah. A very, very big wall. Big, yeah. hairy wall. When we get on with a large, large band, 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 band. You're right at church, your throws me. Which one's he singing now? And then there's the other two to get right now. I know. Oh, God. They're easier. I like yeah, that's better. And then once we'd got that complete, um, we then had to get another word uh, right. <laughs> can't get the last line flat, of it's the nice. vocals. You can get the last line, it's it's one word, last word. Last one word and we finish note. a whole lot of recording. Would you rather can't do get the lead it. vocal first? One word. And that's it, we finished. We're just going to mix it down after this. The problem we had was that all of a sudden, here we are in a high quality recording studio uh, and it was capturing every detail of our performance, including any existing imperfections that would I guess previously have been disguised by live performance in echoey concert rooms or whatever. All these things which you get away with live in the studio, you just you can't get away with it, you know. So it just seemed like it was one thing after another. The singer had one melody in his head, and the rest of the band we were looking at a different melody, and that took a lot of takes to try and sort. And I don't, we never did really get there. 
So yeah, it just seemed like it was one thing after another. The problem with the singing again. You there? After 35, 35 There's takes. A bit of an issue. 35 takes of that one word. I'll just show there you is now another line that isn't right. So we've got to sit here for another half an hour and wait for Ian to get it right again. Uh, we're just going to hear it again. With time ticking on and expensive studio money burning away, it was looking more like those six tracks would end up being two tracks, unless they could tighten up their act. I was losing the will to live. There's no point in it going off because it's all been seven. It was quite difficult sometimes to, uh, to operate effectively when when they were slagging me off. I don't I don't think I've merited as much of the the uh, the bad the bad mouthing as, as I got. Somebody got a cigarette off extremely space. Shut up. When you're you're committing it to to Cheers. wax cylinder, um, it uh, you have to get it right. And I think at the time there was a perception that Hold on, has he ever made this? Is this something that we've we've just assumed was happening? But it, it, all of these things, it made it quite difficult for me. Uh, and obviously, the more you, you try, the more you get criticised for these things, the harder it becomes. Time to make your mind up, it builds up. Change the word in the end to play instead of place because you couldn't get it right. The bickering was incessant. Thirty-five did, takes. Did the back end do that? The back it's back not place. It's, it's not play. There's a C at the end of it. Thirty-five takes for one word. Can you believe that? Uh, the thing was, they were all falling out in the, the control room. They're all at the back on the sofas, all niggling away at each other, and I'm trying to listen as carefully as I can to the track, trying to suss out what's going wrong. And all I can hear is in the background, a fight breaking out because of people falling out about what we're trying to listen to. It's a ball leg when it's like that. Let's be honest, Robin, Robin used to mess up solos all the time. Uh, uh, the amount of times that he, he, he couldn't hit a note or, or would play a solo in completely the wrong key. Favourite fuzzy logic moment apart from today? When we sat to Jonah. Yeah. We still haven't rehired him actually. Yeah, no, he's, done, he's done two gigs. Two gigs for free. He's not getting paid for it. He doesn't know this well, yet. Did you actually sack him? We sacked him before the White Elephant gig. I don't remember which specific time that was. We sacked Ian every other day and he made his way back in somehow. He, we just seemed to forget that it happened and then he'd do something else that would annoy us and so we'd fire him again. Um, I don't really remember sacking him before the studio sessions, but it wouldn't surprise me if we did. Me and Rob, they used, they used to uh, sack me all the time, uh, but without me, I think, I think they all knew that. There was no fuzzy logic. I, I was fuzzy logic. It was, it was all about me. Mounting tensions and fickle finger pointing were showing that proceedings in the studio were going far from okay. Okay, should we go for it? Look, just... Despite the difficulties nailing the music, OK remains one of Fuzzy Logic's most successful hits. Time to make your mind up if you I remember the writing process for OK and I was trying to explain the way that the tune went because it had been floating around in my head for weeks and uh, finally after a couple of times of trying I think that uh, 
the rest of the band realised that it might be something. Um, it might be a dodgy James Bond ripoff, but it might be something. <laughs> With the uh, riff in OK, I didn't realise that it sounded like a James Bond thing um, for, for, for quite a while. Um, but by the time the song was put together and, and was uh, complete and, and then it sort of, you know, someone said, oh, that's quite James Bond theme-y. Um, and I was like, well, yes, it is, I suppose, but um, I can't be bothered to rewrite it. <laughs> OK is about reaching a crossroads in a relationship. Um, sort of, I suppose you, you'd look at it and say that it, it's probably about self-validation. Idea that uh, do you think I'm okay? Um, is is this the way that you think that things should be in a relationship? Um, I don't necessarily think that it's sort of that sort of whole questioning thing is something that's that's often done in in some certainly not effectively. Do you think I'm okay? Are you happy on the bass with that one? Sorry? Are you happy with the bass? Yeah, I'm going to do the backing vocals on this song. It's called OK. Yeah. And, um, so I'll do it. I'll sing along. It's the only song that I've actually got a writing credit on. Um, I came up with the line... Um, what was my line? What did I write? Do you think I'm okay? Do you think I'm fine? Does it make you happy? Does it make you want to be mine? That was my line. I wrote that. Very proud of that, even though it doesn't quite scan. Looking back, some of the, the lyrics were, were, were very dark, but it contrasted to this sort of stage persona of being all, wow, look at me. Yeah. Um, and at the time, I, I was quite aware of that. I don't know necessarily whether it was something that I, I purposely courted, but the lyrics were the lyrics. I, I, I don't, without sounding too sort of, la di da or woo-woo, I think that it was almost like I, I wasn't necessarily writing the lyrics, I was just catching the words. And it, it just, yeah, I didn't really have much choice over what came out. solo in uh, OK. I think it's quite a soaring solo that cuts through the, um, uh, the, the, the misery and sorrow of the lyrics. There we go. Stand by. Now. Now it is. Yeah. There we go. probably sounds like a really impressive technical uh, piece of wizardry, but it was pretty simple and uh, I always found it pretty easy to play. On his day, Rob could play absolutely anything and he could play it really well. Um, off his day, he would bend the wrong note and um, he would miss parts of solos.
he once played the Mr. Brownstone solo. No perfect. It was absolutely spot on. You would think Slash had done it, but he was not playing the same song as the rest of the band. It was in a completely different key. He used to make... I suppose you'd look at it and say silly errors, but um, there were a lot of them. In the studio, things grind down once again I'll just pop down and have a look, when Joe breaks one of his strings, which was always a regular occurrence. <laughs> Joe's yeah, right. probably, it's in between those two, so I'll probably do. How long will it take to do? I don't know. That was an edge, five bucks. It's an A string. I've already broken my E string. Not sure what was wrong with Joe or his equipment, but he kept breaking bass strings. We got to the studio and guess what? Breaks another string. Breaks another string and obviously doesn't carry spares, can't afford them, student. Now I've played bass in bands since Fuzzy Logic and I know that that's not easy to do. In fact, I don't think I've ever broken a bass string in my life. Um, but he was breaking them all the time. I used to despair at him. I've got three spare strings. They have to be the string I haven't got that break. True to form, we're in the studio, breaks a string. Again, time that we're paying for and uh, being the student that he was, he didn't have any spare uh, strings or money to buy any. Do you want to chop to chop? Do you want to just buy? How much are they? Fifteen quid for set. I'm yeah. Yeah. I've got. Have you got any money on them? Well, do that then. Or uh, leave the string off, Joe. No. I just don't get how he kept breaking these strings. I mean, his right hand must have been made of iron. Why was it that strong? bass player kept breaking his bass strings, uh, so that didn't help. His, his right hand, it was, it was an immense strength in his right hand, and this sort of constant fiddling uh, strength comes from. There's a strength in his fingers that you have to wonder. It's, it's not normal. It's definitely not normal. I found out years later why the strings kept breaking. Uh, basically on um, a guitar you have these sort of grooves uh, in which the strings sit through, so there's four of them, and that's called the nut. Uh, and basically what's, what was happening was uh, in each of the grooves uh, there were sharp bits of plastic or whatever uh, that basically just needed filing. <laughs> Despite their recording day riddled with endless difficulties, the band did manage to finish the session. Along with a second day in the studio two months later, they completed their six-track EP. I'd like to sort of remember it in a nice, warm, soft, hazy light that we were absolutely, you know, lovely and, and got on well, but I know that that wasn't the case. They were all getting pretty wound up, uh, and I do remember I ended up saying to one of them, because he wasn't getting it. It's like, you know, you need to relax. Do you want to have a break? You know, maybe go have a tea or a coffee, go for a walk. And he replied, oh, I did that this morning. Hey, it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Who killed him? <laughs> I love you, Tarquin. <laughs> it wasn't just the band there that brought along mates and uh, you, you're trying to listen closely to a song and all you've got going on in the background is a party. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll only take 10 minutes to record it, it doesn't matter about the word. No, that's not wrong. So yeah, it got, it got really, really quite difficult trying to uh, sort it out. Did you know that Mark Morrison was um, First artist from Leicester to chat at number one since Shwadi Wadi. Right, right. Well done, eh? You end up wanting to tell them to go in the direction of off, but you can't do that. You have no thoughts on this? I don't think at all. <laughs> I never returned to capture that second day in the studio. I couldn't bear another single moment putting up with their unprofessional nonsense. A sentiment also echoed by others. Do you know 
what it is. But sometimes I feel really embarrassed to know all of you. Ah, I'm so shy. You can't be enjoying No, I'm going to just go. I'm walking home. How did Fuzzy Logic's session go? Well, it could have gone better. You look at everything in the studio to try and get it as good as you can get it. Uh, get everything spot on. Uh, uh, in Fuzzy Logic's case, it was spot off. On top of OK, watch the ashes and gets me through the night. They kick out Make My Ears Bleed, Hindsight and Both Ways, thus completing their six track EP. When we played those songs for the first time in the studio, listening to them back, it was a bit of a... it blew your mind a little bit because it's like, oh, this is what we actually sound like and we're good. Is the amount of reverb on the track okay? Pulling this a little bit too much yeah. and then and then maybe the solos need a little bit more so that they meet some in the middle. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they sound a little bit like out of in place with each other. Yeah, like okay. a normal song. Yeah, I know what you Other mean. than that, fantastic. Yeah, it's really good. I remember sort of, I think it was quite quite an emotional thing in, in some, some respects, listening back to what we'd done. Um, it was a realisation that this was something we'd made. Um, this was, I mean, these were songs that, that certainly a large proportion of it I'd written. And all of a sudden, there it is in front of our ears. The magic of high tech equipment. Yeah, come on, this sound good. This is it. This is the mini hey, the dat and the dat type as well. Look, see the and dat type. Why is it? And I'm going home now. See to end up with something physical in your hand that says that this is what we've achieved. These are our songs, and this is what we're putting out to the public. Look, yeah, I'll hold it to the microphone. It it sounds good, isn't it? It sounds good. really good, doesn't it? Let's listen to that. Obviously, it's not playing, but if it were playing, it'd sound really good. Right. Okay. What? Well, yeah. It was we had about 300 CDs pressed. We sold as many CDs as we could. Um, I've still got about 180 CDs in my garage. I remember we took the CD, the mixed CD, down to the cock, and we'd asked them to pull it through the uh, PA system. Uh, we'd had some kind of listening party. I think we'd invited friends and family, uh, and it sounded brilliant. Just hear it in a, you know, in a in a in a pub environment through a half decent sound system. Uh, and in fact, I remember we we used to take that CD uh, with us whenever we went to you know like rock clubs or whatever. And we'd always we'd always ask the DJ to play a couple of tracks on the EP, and that was amazing. You know, to hear to hear our tracks through a proper banging club sound system with hundred odd people dancing. Brilliant. Well, it's been hard. It's been long. No, um, it's, it's, been, it's been difficult. Especially the third part of takes of okay. with your lies. with your lies. I think it's time to be me up. Shortly after the studio sessions, the band hired Lewis Field to play rhythm guitar. I was brought in because it enabled Robin to go and wig out on his uh, on his grand solos and, and have a bit more of a fuller sound with someone playing chords in the back. I think if I'd have been there for in the recording studios, things might have been slightly different. Um, you know, we might have been able to get out of there a bit quicker. Lewis quickly became the second vocalist and helped steer the sound in another direction as the band continued to gig.
I was writing or playing was probably coming more from, from was a little bit softer, I suppose. Um, and that's probably what came through with the songs that we started doing um, towards the end of Fuzzy Logic when my, when my songs were coming to the fore. And I'm just wondering Probably one of our biggest highlights for me was uh, our gig in a town called Redon in France. Um, we were in the middle of a town square on a stage. I remember there was this huge church sort of in front of us all lit up with people all around us, 360 degrees all around us. And there was probably at least a thousand people there. And it was just, it was spectacular. I feel like I want to be a better man. Something about playing outside, it was, you know, we'd always, I'd always played inside for gigs, but that, an outside gig, just, it's magical. And at night, and everyone was coming past and buzzing and, and standing and watching, and, you know, that was, that was what, probably my favourite gig. song and this French guy gets up on the stage with us and starts moshing as if we were sepultura um, like doing properly doing the the, uh, the, the the pull down death claw and I wouldn't have minded but we were playing a ballad at the time. table in, in the cock um, where we sat there and, and Robin basically said I think that we should we should jack it in split it up um, and we did and I don't think I realized then quite what a big part of my life it had been September 13th 2002 Fuzzy Logic's last stand was performed in the cock function room. The private audience was summoned to mourn or depending on one's perspective, to celebrate Joe's full-time move up north to start university. business to get into um, and that was back when bands did make money out of being a band.
from technologies um, hadn't or had got so far but hadn't necessarily streaming and that sort of thing hadn't come in um, where you could still make money out of music and publicise your music online we, we were pre all of that we, we sort of had an expectation that if we just sat there and did what we did eventually we'd get noticed and you know looking at it now it's, it's, it's shouting to the wind Fuzzy Logic failed. I think you've got to look at the geography uh, and the history. Uh, nothing good has ever come out of Northampton. You know, Joe Wiley, you know, it's just it's Faye Tozer, Dr. Martin's Boots, you know. Northampton hasn't seen any culture since Oliver Cromwell wiped it out at the Battle of Naseby. Well, I think we failed. I think we did exactly what we had to do uh, when we did it, and it was great for all of us. It became my family, you know, I didn't have anyone up there. And, you know, we were like a band of brothers, really, that um, we were practicing one night and then we were at an open mic another night and then we were gigging once or twice a week. And there was times when everyone got on each other's nerves, but... Um, you know, that's part of being in a band and being in a family. After recording that CD, everything took off. I mean, it, was, it was just great. There was the unfortunate incident where we lost Joe. What do you mean, he died? No, 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 we lost him on the way back from Corby. He just disappeared. So... But things went from strength to strength. We found him again and, and uh, we moved on. And... The years afterwards, in terms of, um, it, it felt like a loss. It felt like a, a, a bereavement in some respects. Um, I struggled to come to terms with it. I think I, I tried to put together reunion gigs for a number of years. Um, I had some sort of idea in my mind that we might be able to just pick up and carry on where we left off. Um, but obviously, Real life gets in the way of all that sort of thing. Everything's everything's gone fine since then. I, I, I wouldn't be the superstar I am today if it hadn't been for that recording. To be perfectly honest with you. Ian went on to become a published author. He he wrote a couple of books and um, got them published. I don't know if anyone bought them, but they were definitely published, self-published. If it hadn't been for Fuzzy Logic, I probably never would have got a passport. So. At least some good came of it. Where's Joe? Oh, yeah. Joe doesn't do it for fun. I remember at the time, there was a, a good energy, a real buzz that I wanted to capture. But as soon as I pointed the cameras at them and their egos got in the way, I realised they were just novices in a small town. They tried, but they failed. Ultimately, they couldn't organise a fire in a match factory. The greatest compliment to Fuzzy logic is that I'd do it all again in a heartbeat. Loved every minute. It was fantastic. I'd do it again in a heartbeat if I could. I just have really fond memories of that particular time, um, and such a such a great thing to have happened. I think. Fuzzy logic helped me transition 
from boy to man. And I think we all should look back on it and say that was one of the best times of our lives. I went abroad again. I went abroad again after France. Um, I, I went to uh, uh, Greece. Uh, I went to um, Ireland several times. I went to um, uh, I went to France again. I went to Italy as well. I've, I've also been to Spain, but only only to walk through Spain. I didn't actually start there. So when I was on stage, um, I wanted to. Uh show a difference uh, between when I was playing rhythm guitar and, and lead guitar. So position one, as it was called, was like this sort of stance, holding the guitar normally, playing riffs, chords, that sort of thing. Position two would be for the, the fancier work, the solo stuff, feet a bit further apart, guitar up like that, solo work. So you see you've got position one, position two. Position one, position two. Ian used to have a particular penchant for doing impressions, one of which was Jimmy Savile. Of course, you know he used to present Top of the Pops, don't you? Jimmy Savile, wasn't it? Come on, 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 Maybe he could do an impression of Gary Glitter as well. Who knows? He said he's not hungry. It's all right. I've had my loaf of bread and my cheese. You thing. Say it. Say it. No, he's, he's not hungry. hungry. He's not hungry. <laughs> Am I, uh, we're we're going to go, go to McDonald's now, yeah. then to Burger King, probably KFC as well, then get some fish and chips, bring them all back here and eat them in front of him. And we've brought you a pizza, really. <laughs> <laughs>